everybody, John M. Good here. Hello and greetings to the beautiful state of Ohio. We are located somewhere around Concord, Ohio. Alright, we have 651 miles to go to Sheboygan. Today, once again, it is uh, Saturday, October 8, 2000. 16 we have six hours and 42 minutes before we need to take a 30 minute break as you can see the uh, colors up here are really beginning to change give it about one more one or two more week in fact the leaves are beginning to drop uh, slowly then that magical moment happens when the leaves starts to fall well sit back relax and uh, enjoy the scenery of Ohio By the way, before I forget, I would like to say hello and greetings to my good friend Laura Smith, all the way down in Florida. Hello, Laura. I hope you are enjoying the view up here up north. And by the way, Laura, I hope you are doing well of the uh, Hurricane Matthew. From what I understand, a lot of you down there don't have electric power. In fact, uh, my friend Bob from uh, New Smyrna Beach made a comment that uh, since there's no electric power, he, may, he might as well go on a cruise ship. But how can you go on a cruise ship when the hurricane is going on? I don't know. <laughs> I wouldn't go on a cruise ship during a, a hurricane, right? I've never been on a cruise ship before. That'd be one interesting experience. Oh, can you imagine the videos that I can make on a cruise ship? Now let's just say, if I was to go on a cruise ship, right? Couldn't I claim that as a, uh, a business expense? Right? And as long as I am there to do videos on a cruise ship, why couldn't I claimed out all my taxes. Interesting concept. I mean, it's business expense, like when I buy cameras and tripods and memory cards and batteries. You know, it, it'd be a, uh, I guess if a YouTube channel was big enough that you can afford to go on a business trip, 
you could pretty much go anywhere almost fully paid or you know like a paid vacation kind of a paid working vacation go anywhere in the world but of course your channel has to be really 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 big or lots of views anyway For example, if I was to buy me a Dodge Ram Dually with a Cummins engine and start hauling campers, not only that I can use that as a tax write-off on, you know, but I, could I claim that also as a tool for my YouTube videos? Nah, I don't think so. <laughs> I I tell you, I really wouldn't mind experiencing that line of work. Of course, I think the smartest way to do it would be find a company and drive for them for a little bit. Get your feet on, uh, get your feet wet, get a little experience before you start buying a, what is a sixty, seventy thousand dollar equipment. And of course, you could buy used ones, but hey, I like things that are brand new. I really do. Expensive way to go, but. At least you know all the warranties are in. By the way, that Love's truck stop we just passed, that was the... Uh, that's where I wanted to make it last night, but... I think I only had 19 minutes remaining when I pulled over last time. I can't remember anymore. Pretty close to it. I wasn't going to make it anyway.
boyhood home of Frank and Jesse James, most famous outlaws in the world. The James Farm is located about three miles east of Kearney, Missouri. Now, Alexander Franklin James was born here on January the 10th, 1843. Two years later, July the 19th, 1845, Robert James Jr. was born with complications. He died 33 days later. Two years after baby Robert's death, Jesse Woodson James was born, September the 5th, 1847. Now, two years after Jesse and six years after Frank's birth, their sister Susan Lavina James was born, November the 25th, 1849. Their parents were Robert Saley James and Zerelda Cole James. Now, Robert was a Baptist minister with a college degree. He had an extensive library and he loved reading that his oldest son Frank inherited often quoting Shakespeare, even in the midst of a robbery. The Jameses were considered to be a prosperous, respectable family. They were also slave owners, and that would place them on the side of the South during the Civil War. It was said that they treated their slaves well. Even after the war, their slaves, a lot of them stayed with them as hired help. Now, ten years before the war, in 1850, Reverend Robert James was asked to serve as captain on a wagon train that was headed to California gold fields. On April 12, 1850, he left Zerelda and the children, along with a few slaves, with a farm and headed west. On August 1, 1850, after arriving in California, Robert Saley James died from the fever after drinking contaminated water. He was buried in an unmarked grave. It was never located. Now, Zerelda was left with three young children to raise. So on September the 10th, 1852, two years after word of Robert's death, Zerelda marries a wealthy nearby farmer by the name of Benjamin Sims. It was not a very good marriage. Sims had trouble with the boys, and Zerelda was overprotective. In 1854, after two years of marriage, Zerelda files for divorce, which was unheard of almost at that time. However, before the divorce came through, Sims was killed from a horse accident. The next year in 1855, Zerelda marries Dr. Archie Reuben Samuels. They will have four more children. Dr. Samuels' easygoing nature allowed the more strong wills Zerelda to make all the decisions. Now it must have worked, for they remained married almost 60 years. The boys got along well with their stepfather. He encouraged Frank in his desire to become a school teacher and young Jesse's desire to be a minister. At the beginning of the Civil War, Missouri was divided between the North and South. Now the Jameses, being slave owners, had made 18-year-old Frank join the rebel cause. On the 26th of May, 1863, 15-year-old Jesse was plying one of these fields here close to his home. When the Union militia arrived, seeking information about Quantrell's Raiders, of which Frank was riding with. Unable to obtain information, Jesse was beaten up badly by the militia, and Dr. Samuels was dragged to the woods and hanged. Although he lived, his mental capacity was greatly diminished. By age 16, Jesse followed Frank into the war eventually riding with William Bloody Bill Anderson. Now, Bloody Bill was one of the worst of the worst. Jesse and Frank participated in raids such as the 1864 raid on Centralia, Missouri, where unarmed Union soldiers were killed and mutilated. Even scalps were taken. 
In May of 1865, Jesse was shot in the chest by Union cavalry near Lexington, Missouri. He stated that he was trying to surrender when shot. The war had just ended. To recuperate from his wounds, Jesse was staying with his aunt and uncle in their boarding house in North Kansas City. His wounds were being attended to by his first cousin, Zarelda Mims, nicknamed Z. Now, Z had been named after her aunt Zarelda, who was Jesse's mother. The couple quickly fell in love and became engaged. Although Jesse's mother was against any marriage. However, it'll be nine years later before they actually married. While Jesse was still recuperating, his ex-Confederate friends such as Bob, Jim, and Cole Younger were becoming outlaws. It's believed that on February the 13th, 1866, Jesse and Frank started their outlaw career by robbing the Clay County Savings Bank in Liberty, Missouri. It was the first peacetime bank robbery in the United States. During the robbery, the 17-year-old student from William Jewell College was killed. Now the college, ironic, was the same college that their daddy, Robert James, had helped to start. Now this is a 1967 photo of Frank James and Fletcher Taylor and Jesse James. Now Jesse was still having problems with his bullet wounds at that time and they had traveled to Nashville to confer with a doctor. And you can see that Fletcher Taylor had a missing arm that he lost during the war. Now this is a family photo believed to be taken around October of 1868. Now back row, third from the left, is Jesse James, not yet famous. Z. Mims, next to Jesse, will become his future wife. Second row and second from the left is Jesse's stepfather, Dr. Rubin Samuels. Now their mother, Zarelda James Samuel, is third from the left. Front row, believed to be Jesse's half-brother, John T. Samuels. And next to him on the far right is Jesse's sister, Suzanne. Suzanne Lavina James married Alan Palmer in 1870. Palmer was one of the youngest soldiers to serve with Frank and Jesse under William Quantrell. He is alleged to have been a member of the James Gang later on. After marriage, Susan and Allen moved to Archer City, Texas. They often served as a hiding place for Frank and Jesse. Susan had six children. She died in 1889 while giving birth to her sixth child. She was 39 years old. Now, Susan is buried at the Riverside Cemetery in Wichita Falls, Texas. In December of 1869, it was the first time that the public had really heard of Jesse James. Jesse and others robbed the Davis County Savings Bank in Gallatin, Missouri, and Jesse, in cold blood, kills the cashier that he thought had killed Bloody Bill Anderson during the war. He killed the wrong man. Now, newspapers began covering the James Gang as uh, mistreated ex-Confederates robbing from northern carpetbaggers and giving their money to poor farmers. The legend of Jesse James was created by John Newton Edwards, the publisher of the Kansas City Times. Not everyone, however, believed that Jesse James was a Robin Hood, such as Alan Pinkerton, of the famed Pinkerton Detective Agency. This is Alan Pinkerton on the left, serving as security for President Lincoln during the war. The Pinkertons were hired by the railroads to get rid of the James and Younger gang. Now, Pinkerton sent agent, one of his best, John W. Witcher, to Clay County, Missouri, in order to locate the Jameses. 
he was found dead, shot through the stomach. Alan Pinkerton took this murder of his agent personally. In 1874, the gang held up the train in Gads Hill, Missouri. They thought that Alan Pinkerton would be aboard the train, and they fully intended to kill him. He was not. So they robbed the mail car and the passengers. Now that same year, in April of 24, 1874, Jesse Marys finally Zarelda Mims, his first cousin. Jesse was a wanted man, so they were married at Z. Mims' sister's house in Kearney and married by one of his kinfolk. On January the 26th, 1875, Pinkerton agents acting on a tip from a neighbor of the Jameses that was keeping an eye on the farm for them, sneaked from the neighbor's farmhouse through these woods around midnight. Now, they had already set fire to the west side of the house that afternoon, and it was put out by tearing boards off the side. Now, but that night, they came back to finish the job. Now, the window on the left was where Zerelda, Jesse's mother, and half-brother, eight-year-old Archie, was sleeping. Now, this window where, here is where agents throwed a descendory advice through. As a matter of fact, they, they actually threw several of them. Servants were sleeping in this room. And as Zerelda and Archie rushed in to see what the commotion was, the device exploded. Archie was killed, and Zerelda's arm was maimed and later had to be amputated. Others in the room were also wounded by strapnel. After the raid, sympathy spread for the Jameses. The Pinkerton sort of lost interest in chasing Jesse and Frank James. It was simply too costly, but not in time to keep the neighbor from receiving two bullet holes through the head believed to have been compliments of Frank James. Seven months after the raid on the James Farms, on August the 31st, 1875, Jesse and C's first child, Jesse James Jr., was born. When Jesse Jr. was one year old, his daddy, along with his brother, Frank, and the younger brothers, was on their way to Northfield, Minnesota some 400 miles north of Carney. As was custom, Jesse Frank and the Youngers, Bob, Jim, and Cole, along with Bill Chadwell, Sal Miller, and Charlie Pitts, got a train to St. Paul, Minnesota. Now after they arrived, they bought the most powerful and fastest mounts that they could find. Around 2 p.m. on September the 7th, 1876, the James Younger Gang, fully armed with six to four pistols each, wearing long link dusters to conceal their weapons, rode into Northfield, Minnesota. Their aim was to rob the First National Bank. The problem was, many of the Northfield citizens had been soldiers during the war and were familiar with guerrilla tactics and quickly become suspicious. The gang separated in two different groups. There's a question now as to who went into the bank, but it's believed that Bob Younger, Frank James, and Charlie Pitts did. Two others guarded the outside door, believing to have been Cole and Miller and the rest guarded the escape route. Now, hardware owner J.S. Allen was going to the bank when he was turned around by Miller and Cole. Allen then ran and sounded the alarm. Inside the bank, they were taken longer than expected. Cashier Joseph Lee Haywood was refusing to open a safe, claiming that it was on a time lock. It wasn't. A knife was placed to his throat and a gun butt across his head. Now this was standard practice for the outlaws, but they had never run into anyone who refused after that, as Haywood did. Now Alonzo Bunker, another bank employee, bolted out the back door. He was shot in the shoulder by Charlie Pitts. 
Word outside was beginning to pass around that the bank was being robbed. The gang of outlaws had made the decision beforehand that no one was to be killed in the robbery. And they really tried to keep their word. So they began riding up and down the streets, far and into the air, and discouraging citizens. Now this was a standard practice of the gang. Except here, citizens began arming themselves and shooting from cover back at the outlaws. Now Northfield citizens after the raid said that the outlaws were terrible shots, not knowing that the gang was trying not to kill anyone. Inside the bank, the outlaws knew things were going bad and decided to leave without any money, but not before killing Joseph Haywood. Now, Cole Younger on his dying bed said years later that Frank James was the one that killed Haywood. As the outlaws fought their way out of town, Bob Younger was shot in the elbow, Cole Younger in the hip, Jim in the jaw. Now, Sal Miller and Bill Chadwell lay dying in the streets. Two Northfield citizens were left dead, including banker Joseph Haywood. After being chased almost a hundred miles around Minnesota, Bob, Jim, and Cole, along with Charlie Pitts, was located and surrounded. Believing they would be hanged on the spot if captured, they fought it out with a posse. Now, Jim Younger, top row, third from the left, was shot again, but lived. Charlie Pitts, bottom row, first left, was killed. Cole and Bob Younger both shot again, but they both lived. Tried for murder and sentenced to 25 years in the state pen. Bob died in prison in 1889. He contracted tuberculosis. Jim was paroled in 1901, but committed suicide shortly after over a love affair. Cole was pardoned fully in 1903. Reunited with old friends, Frank and James, they toured the country together. He said that he could have gotten out of prison earlier, but he refused to say that the Jameses were in on the Northfield raid. Cole Younger died quietly on March the 21st, 1960, at the age of 72. He's buried in the Lee Summit Historical Cemetery in Missouri. Now after the Northfield robbery, Jesse and Frank made their way back to Missouri and eventually to Nashville, Tennessee. They go into hiding with their families. Jesse becomes Thomas Howard and Frank becomes B.J. Woodson. Now one year later on February the 28th, 1878, Jesse and Z had twin boys, Gould and Montgomery. Unfortunately, they died as infants. The next year, June the 17th, 1879, Mary Jane was born. Now this is Mary on the left and Jesse Jr. on the right. By this time, Frank's wounds were healed and they were both established as family men located in Nashville. However, money was getting short and during this period, Jesse and Bill Ryan and one more robbed the payroll master in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. Years later, Frank will stand trial for this robbery, but will be acquitted because it's believed that he actually wasn't a part of the robbery. Bill Ryan will get drunk and start talking in a saloon north of Nashville. He will serve time in the pen for this crime. Now the heat was on Frank and Jesse, so they moved their families back to Missouri. Now this saddle belonged to Jesse James. He rode many a 